This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, welcome to the 30th anniversary celebration of Footloose. Um, I'm the Policy Director, Matt Ryan, and this is brought to you by the Department of Film and Media Studies, the Carr School Center, and these awesome Policy Theater interns that you see behind the camera right now. They're the ones who actually produce and direct this entire show and the Q&A part. So it is the, the interns that have taken us back to the like, the way cool era of the 80s. Uh, so we have a totally tubular guest, and I'm just getting flagged by my student assistant to stop talking A slang. Okay. Uh, he, he was cast in Bob Fosse's directed Broadway show Pippin, his title character. Please welcome Dean Pitchford. <laughs> I sort of aborted your, your intro, didn't that's I? That's fine, that's I, fine. I, no, I, I, I like the more dramatic dance move in here. Ah. So it was pretty awesome. So let's start, uh, let's have the first question. So how was it seeing the 30th anniversary in a movie theater with an audience? Well, I was saying beforehand that I hadn't seen this movie really in 30 years because I, I watched it a lot, as you can imagine, while we were making it. And then every time I watched it until we opened was always sitting in the back of an auditorium like this with a test audience and being very, very nervous and pacing and then being with the executives from Paramount and my agents and everybody who was like wondering whether this is going to make a fly or, or tank. And so there was a lot of anxiety around it. And only on the opening weekend did I, with one of the producers, we got a car. We had a car and driver take us around to the various theaters and we would sneak in the back and we would listen to the audience's reaction and then leave and leave and then just went home and crossed our fingers and hoped. And then I haven't seen it in a movie theater since then. I haven't seen it this big since then. And so it was, it was pretty fabulous. I was just saying that I was having flashbacks, 100 flashbacks a second, because every scene was all about the writing of it and the casting of it and what was happening that day and the difficulty we had with the locations. And so much stuff went into every, every frame of that. <laughs> All right, so writers draw on personal experience quite often when they're writing. So who in real life repressed your musical talent? Or from who you for singing and dancing? Um, gosh, I don't know that it was my, it was not my singing and dancing. You know, this is one of those, I, I think I mentioned this story when I was here with Sherry, but I had been, I wrote this whole movie, filmed this whole movie, was living through the, the aftermath of the movie and never ever saw myself in this movie. I never understood uh, that, that it, was, it, it had anything to do with my life. And then about a year and a half later, I had to go to, I was speaking at a film conference in Seattle and I was picked up by an intern who was driving me around for the weekend. And he said to me, um, now I gotta ask you something, you know, cause you grew up in Honolulu. I was born and raised in Hawaii. And then when I was, my parents separated when I was uh, 11 years old, and then my parents tried to put it back together again. And we moved, my mom and four kids, moved from Honolulu to Kansas City, Missouri, which was the middle of the middle of the middle of America. And we arrived there, and I felt like such a fish out of water because I, there was, it was a very, it was a Catholic school, very traditional, very hidebound. And this, guy who's driving me around Seattle asks me whether that part of my childhood was the inspiration for this movie. And I, it completely blindsided me because I had, I had lived this movie. I had gone <laughs> from a very, you know, Honolulu for, for the fact that it's on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is still very multicultural, very Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, Caucasian, all these other influences. And I got to Kansas City, and it was like one color, mm. one <laughs> just monochromatic in, in my way of thinking. And that was really, that was the year that I spent like sitting on my feelings 
in Kansas City. Interesting. Uh, I actually, the, the, the theme of grief is prevalent in the movie. I mean, the, especially in the between Ariel and her dad. Yeah. Uh, how did that relation grow when you're writing the father-daughter both dealing with the loss of their brother and the son? Well, that's interesting. I was thinking about this today because when I first, you know, this movie went through 22 drafts. I wrote 22 drafts of this movie. And it was first commissioned at 20th Century Fox. It was put into turnaround and it went over to Paramount. At Paramount, Herbert Ross was going to be the director. He left in a contract dispute. Michael Cimino came in to be the director. Mm. It was going to be his first movie after he had bankrupted United Artists <laughs> with Heaven's Gate. <laughs> and he and I worked on a draft of this movie for about three months, and it became an impossible situation. Fortunately, the studio stepped in and fired him. I, didn't, I, I, I was not mm. subjected to having to go through that. And then they came back to Herbert Ross. While we're doing this, the people at the top of the food chain at Paramount leave, mm. and they're uh, executives. So every step of the way, we are, I'm rewriting for this studio, then that studio, then this director, then a new director, then the first director, then a <laughs> new studio president. And all the way along the way, I'm learning something. But one of the things I remember today was that when I first wrote the first three, four, five, six drafts of this, there was no backstory about the minister and his son and mm -hmm. the car crash and that whole thing. Uh, the minister was simply, he was intractable. He was, he believed it was my way or the highway and that was his story. That was going to be his story. And uh, Craig Zayden, one of the producers, kept saying to me, he, he's got to raise the stakes somehow. There's got to be a little bit more that he is at stake here. And I realized, that I had one main character with a wound mm. that was Ren's father had walked out on him. And so I had a boy without a father. And I thought the symmetry would be a father without a son. So I had the idea of the car wreck, which threw, threw the entire town into mourning. Mm. And the minister, who was the most wounded of that, took advantage of that to put it into this state, which was a much more human way of coming to this situation, a town where you couldn't dance, not because that's what it says in the Bible, but because that's what this minister has done in order to shut out the world and save himself from the pain. And so then what happened was it just blew the whole thing wide open because then there was a man with a wound and a boy with a wound, and the boy's working through his wound by, by shaking things up, and the man is, is trying to keep that door closed. Please, please, please don't make me open that door and deal with the pain of my, my son. And his daughter is banging on that door, mm -hmm. and she's trying to, like, pick at his wound. And eventually, all of these people end up teaching each other something, which they would not have otherwise if this boy hadn't come into town. And our people have often described this as a movie about that town where you can't dance. And I have always described it as a movie about a father without a son and a boy without a father who come to find their, their they, they heal in each other's presence. I find it interesting because Ren is not, and that's the thing is because Ren actually likes, I feel in some ways likes the idea of the dad being overprotective. Like, he doesn't agree with them, but kind of like, you know what, I wish my dad was at least somewhat protective. And I find it interesting because he's not, neither of them were bad guy. John Lithgow is an understandable tragic character. Yeah. He's no. not doing it for evil purposes. No, yeah. no. And that was the great thing because once John Lithgow was cast, it eventually, be, it immediately became apparent that it was never a, 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 a um, fire and brimstone kind of character. Um, but once John Lithgow was cast, he's so human. He's so approachable, so human. I rewrote a lot because of his presence in the movie. And I, I softened him in a way that he was a very sympathetic guy who was, there's a lot, and what Herbert Ross did a lot, and I was watching it today especially, Herbert gives him and his wife a lot of time. You know, mm -hmm. this is thought of as a youth film, but there's a lot of an emphasis on the adult relationships and the the pain that parents have in trying to understand and do the right thing for their children. And that's very clear. The Herbert gives the adults a lot of screen time. Yeah, I found it fascinating. It makes it more real, because he could have just yeah. been the cartoon villain. The oh, evil yeah. preacher and the typical... And that's the way he know. started out, I have to mm -hmm. confess. But once I discovered the, 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 the car wreck that gave the whole town a kind of... And the good thing is that, that 
in the course of writing it, I realized that if I was going to do something, when I first started to pitch this movie, people were saying to me, you know, I like the idea of this movie, but I, I'm having a hard time. This is 1980, 81, around then that I'm pitching it. And they're saying, I'm having a hard time buying the idea of this premise of a town where you can't dance. Have you thought about setting this in like 1959? And I said to them, in 1959, this would not be remarkable. That would not be uh, uh, like, what? It has to be, it has to be at an, you, you can't just tuck it into the past and say, they did those things then. You have to make it a lot more, you have to kind of rub up against contemporary. And then what happened, interestingly enough, along the way is that it became unstuck in time. The only thing that betrays this movie is the hair. Oh, you had a lot of hair. Everybody had so much hair and the costumes. But what I realized when I began to research this movie is that I went to Oklahoma, where this story actually had happened in a small town in Oklahoma, which is, I got the idea from a, a clipping in the newspaper about a town called Elmore City, where dancing had been outlawed for 88 years. And in 1980, an 88-year-old law was repealed, and the high school class of 14 had their first high school mm. prom in 88 years. So I went to Oklahoma. After I wrote the first couple of drafts based on this little tiny news story, I went and I started to do more of my research. And what I found when I got out there was that there were iconic, uh, the, the visuals of that world are relevant now, then, in 1959, and that is pickup trucks, <laughs> gun racks, <laughs> boots, blue jeans. Nobody in this movie uses a cell phone. Nobody <laughs> uses a computer. The minister is typing his lecture on a, on a typewriter. And what ended up happening, and it was really driven home when Herbert Ross came to direct the movie, was that we, we began to undo all anything that would, would stick it to the era, mm. and it became a fable. So it sort of hovers above the time in which it was written, because there's a, there's a universal truth about it. And the universal truth applies 30 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago when we opened it on Broadway. Uh, no, not for, uh, 16 years ago when we opened on Broadway. Um, and all the way through, you can just drop that story down and tell that story and, and people will learn something from it. And we'd be, we were able to, and again, like I said, you can, people do it in high schools, you know, the, the Broadway musical ran for almost two years and now it gets done. Last year we had 375 productions oh, in the geez. United States alone, as well as productions all over the world. And they do it with two sawhorses and a bucket and everybody wears boots and, and blue jeans and it, it, it still tells the same story. Well, it's a very human story, and you know there is book burning still going on. I mean, yeah. the, and you know, and actually, that was one thing that I found extremely interesting. The Reverend is against book burning, and I found that gave him a little more depth too, yeah. because again, he's not just you know how dare you almost destroy these classics. Well, and what's interesting about that is that he is he's responsible for that because of what the way he proselytizes. People take his words and they go one step farther mm -hmm. with it, but it's his seeing. Oh my God, what I cause people to do, this is what my words, the words that I am using, how they hurt people. And they show him how he has been unreasonable. It's the, it's the actual, the holding up of the mirror. And that's why it's very important that Ariel witness her father had that moment of, oh my God, what have I done? That was, that's, that was a good segue to Ariel. I found her also fascinating because in those days, there was always a sexy girl who yeah. was a little wild. But I like the fact that she, she had depth too. She was dealing with pain. She yeah. was acting out. Yeah. Uh, she was actually, I don't know, suicidal is the word, but she pushed it further than even her friends. Oh, yeah. Did. How did that work for you? Because she was a lot more complex than a lot of the women I've seen, especially in the 80s, where they were just kind of... Well, I did find as I began to do research and I talked to people and people hooked me up with other people and they say, I, I know a girl who was the minister's daughter and you should talk to a minister's daughter. And they would, man, a couple of these ladies were really messed up. 
they were, they really, they, they reacted way off in the other direction because they were so tightly controlled at home. And they left home, they did, had their bouts with drugs, they, they danced on the edge. And that was a very real reaction to 18 years of being held back, held down. And, and she's dealing she's dealing with all this grief and her father's not acknowledging that she is having as much grief as he is. He is so locked in his grief that he's not saying to his wife or to his daughter, I know we're all hurting. He is he thinks he alone is hurting. And that was interesting because she she continually is actually asking for help. Yeah. And I found that interesting because again, usually a teenage daughter will avoid it. But I like it, especially in that scene in the church was amazing. Yeah. Where she watches her, her dad again. Yeah, yeah. So is that, did you start with that, or do you, is that something you develop in the script, that you come to that, or are you kind of like, you know what, I need something like that, and I'm going to build towards it? Well, I knew that I needed to have her, uh, um, if you notice, she is pushing him. She's doing it like a little thing, and he's not reacting. A little thing, he's not reacting. When she comes home, and he says, what am I going to do with you? And she says, there ain't nothing to do, Daddy. This is it. It doesn't get much better. That's her kind of going like this, and he steps out of the way, and he lets her go on up to her bedroom. And she's doing this, and she's doing this, and she's trying to get a reaction out of him. She gets a slap out of him. And that's the beginning of something. That's, you know, it explains a lot of abusive relationships where some, uh, somebody slapping you is, uh, is, is interpreted as, as caring. And she is now got her dad. She's pushing him and pushing and pushing him. And that's, that's, what, that's where the scene leads to. Interesting. So now, of course, we got to talk about the star of the movie, Kevin Bacon. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I have to say, I have not seen this, like I said, this performance. And it's staggering to me that he was 23 or 24 years yeah. old and that he had such stillness yeah. and such gravitas. Um, and you know what's also amazing? He came from Philadelphia. Steve, uh, uh, Kevin came out of Philadelphia. And he, he, he wasn't a dancer, per se, but he moved. He moved really well. And there's a lot of body language, like the strut that he does when he, <laughs> when he takes her to the car. And he does that thing, and he's like strut. And it's all, it's, nobody had to put that on Kevin. Hmm. He, was, he grew up like very near the bad side of town in Philly. So he was a bit of a street anyway. And then he brought all that to this, um, but then he also had the good sense to know when to just calm down and let other people fill the stage, fill the screen. That's interesting. And I've also found it interesting, usually uh, going back to typical 80s movies, the, uh, the kid would be a juvenile delinquent again to the law. He wasn't a bad kid. No. You know, and I kind of, and even like he wanted to stay out of the fight with his dad. She told that great scene. You know, I'm I'm not your was a vessel to fight your dad. Yeah, it was interesting, and I think it gave, did you think about it? you want to make it more complex, not just the you know well, juvenile. Well, I wanted movie. him to be a kind of tabula rasa, a clean slate, and he comes into this town, and he's got his he's kind of like in his own, he's in his own pain, and he's trying to like just get through. And then people begin to ascribe things to him. Um, in, the, in the musical, I wrote a lyric for the, the kids in, in the church at the beginning. They sing about this new kid. And they say, there's rumors going around about the new kid. And everybody's talking till they're blue. Because you know how a stranger is. If he's not dumb, he's dangerous. But either way, at least it's something new. And the idea is we've exhausted ourselves talking about all these people that we all know and we know really, really well and we're up to here with the same personnel from our entire childhoods. Here's a new kid. Let's talk about, let's, let's find something to make him interesting. So he's going to be the bad boy. He's going to be the drug dealer. He's going to be you know, the problem starter. He's going to be a, a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And he just gets painted by all these people. Well, I think it's time to talk about one of my favorite characters of the mo uh, movie, the music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How, like, let's, we'll start with Latir for the boy, which is uh, that scene as, uh, you know, every student, even if you haven't seen the movie, everybody knows the scene. Yeah. How did that work? Because the music is a part of the movie. Like, there's the communicating between the music song and the actor well, more than I've seen in most I had scenes. the great advantage of being not only the screenwriter, but the songwriter. And so I always knew... 
I, I always knew going through and writing the movie how many musical sequences there would be and what a kind of a song was going to be in that arena. And so I also knew that I couldn't have like all rock and roll songs or all ballads or anything like that. And I wanted to mix it up so that there was dance music and then there was ballads and then there was some R&B. And so Dancing in the Sheets was mm. Shalimar. And I always, I, I, but I did not know who was gonna be those because we didn't start on the soundtrack until we started filming the movie. Mm. Um, and the funny, funny you should mention Let's Hear It For The Boy because Let's Hear It For The Boy was the last song that we wrote. Oh, interesting. And the reason for that is uh, Tom Snow and I had written a song called Somebody's Eyes. And Somebody's Eyes, Herbert Ross loved Somebody's Eyes. We all love Somebody's Eyes. And it was really all about being in a small town and how everybody like watches you and you're always being seen by somebody's eyes. Um, it was Herbert's favorite. It was one of two songs that was written before the movie started shooting. Somebody's Eyes was written and Footloose was written, but not recorded. Mm. So we used Johnny Be Good, the old oh, Chuck yeah. Berry recording Chuck of Johnny Be Good as playback for all the sequences that use Footloose. So there's Somebody's Eyes, and the choreographer began using Somebody's Eyes to choreograph this sequence and then that sequence too. What ended up happening is we got a number of sequences in the movie, like the dancing in the sheets at the drive-in with the kids dancing, mm -hmm. and the tempos are all similar because they were all choreographed to Somebody's Eyes. Well, as you can imagine, we did Somebody's Eyes in pre-production. We're doing it in rehearsal. They're doing it on the set during the setups with the camera and the whole thing. They're doing it when they're shooting to it. Then they ship the footage back to Los Angeles and we're in the editing room and we're listening to somebody's eyes over and over and over again. And the inevitable happened. Herbert Ross got sick and tired of somebody's eyes. <laughs> he just got up to here with somebody's eyes. And not only it was stayed in the movie, but it was relegated to the, you have to listen very carefully, the scene where uh, Chuck and Ariel have just been rolling around in the mm -hmm. grass and she's putting on her red boots. There's a, a ghetto blaster there. And on the ghetto, this is where, <laughs> this is how far somebody, somebody's eyes went from being in four sequences in the movie to being relegated to a, a, a cue on a, a boombox. <laughs> and we were suddenly without a song for that teaching sequence. Mm -hmm. And all the other songs had been written. We didn't think we were going to need another one, but all of a sudden it was booted and I had to like come up with something. And Tom Snow and I wrote uh, Let's Hear It For The Boy overnight, oh, in a wow. night. Um, <laughs> I went over to his place about four o'clock in the afternoon and we wrote through until about six o'clock in the morning and we finished a very rough demo of it. And that was, that was the result. <laughs> and that was about <laughs> 10 days before we dubbed the movie. Oh, jeez. We didn't have a, an artist for it yet. We fortunately were able to get Denise Williams to fly in. We went into the studio, we recorded her, and we had tracks ready to dub. That's <laughs> and, uh, and Chris Penn, Penn did such a great job. Oh, uh, my yeah, God. Willard, I mean, that yeah. was. Uh, He's fabulous. That and and so actually, you, you mentioned Kevin Bacon's stillness. He's still in that scene. Yeah. He's letting Chris Penn have his moment, which is not normal for the lead actor no. to give no. up you know, one of the big sequences. Yeah. Uh, but all right, so but we do have to talk about the Kevin Bacon dance mill scene. It was most that was the students were asking me most about. How'd that come from you? Because that was a uh, pretty choreographed song. And yeah, that was really uh, to be honest. That was all built. The the I I came to Herbert Ross with the idea that Kevin Kevin's character had a gymnastic background oh. because I thought there. We, we, I, I don't want him to be so physical that he's like a football player or something like that. Um, and Herbert Ross is being a, a dancer himself, an ex-dancer. He's very conscientious about people and how they look moving. And here's a bit of trivia for you. Um, when we were trying to find the role of Kevin, Kevin Bacon's role, we were sort of seeing everybody. We were seeing all the Brat Pack, all the guys who were the hot and happening guys. And um, even uh, to this day, I, I run into Rob Lowe in Santa Barbara, and <laughs> Rob Lowe <laughs> twisted an ankle 
when he was auditioning for us, he actually snapped something in his ankle. And he says he thinks about his audition. And we had to bring an ambulance onto the, the studio <laughs> oh, lot geez. and take him off to the hospital. <laughs> he really got hurt. I mean, he got seriously hurt. And he says whenever it's going to rain, he thinks about Footloose because <laughs> it hurts like that. But here's an interesting thing. We were being very seriously courted by the agents for a new young actor who had just completed his starring role in a new movie and we were actually allowed into the cutting room to see a little bit of footage of Risky Business and <laughs> Tom Cruise <laughs> dancing the rock and roll, you know, the old time rock and roll. And we thought, oh, this could be really interesting. And what had happened was uh, Tom Cruise went from that into a movie called All the Right Moves. Oh, right. And in All the Right Moves, he played a football player. And so he bulked up when he went from risky business into all the right moves. So he, he looked much more convincing as a football player. And Herbert Ross met with him and he said, um, I can't film this boy because he's got, he's just very fleshy and very, and I need, I need some line, you know, as a dancer, mm. he thought about line. And I was thinking about it as I watched him tonight. Lori Singer has got the longest legs in the world. <laughs> and Kevin Bacon has got incredible, incredible, I mean, it looks like his legs go on forever. He, <laughs> he doesn't have to do too much for it to read all the way up and down his body. So Ke it, Kevin Bacon was a real interesting choice for Herbert Ross, but he was not gonna be, with that phys physique, he was not gonna be a football player. So I came up with something else for him to do that would explain some physicality, you know, some way that he was working out his energy, and it resulted in his being a gymnast. So that little sequence the that sequence we set him up talking to Willard, and then when he goes crazy in the, the mill, in the steel mill, the roller mill, they call it, uh, it excuses a lot of activity that's not just dance activity because it's not just a dance solo. He's flying around, he's sliding down staircases, and he's doing uh, uh, giants on the, on the high bar and things like that. So it, it enables him to do movement that's not just uh, static, just not just dance movement. Yeah, I was going to do that for tonight, but I decided <laughs> against it. Uh, now, I remember my 80s prom. I didn't have those moves. No. These guys, and they never learned to dance, and they had some pretty good moves. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's interesting you bring that up because <laughs> another secret about this movie, um, Herbert Ross had just before we made this movie, he made a movie called Pennies from Heaven, which was a very well-received, uh, but it didn't do very well, but it was a very well-received artistic triumph. And in it, he had done a sequence, Pennies from Heaven, with a tap dancer in slow motion while what looked like copper coins trickled down over him while he danced in slow motion. And it was really hypnotic, it was really quite beautiful. And so what Herbert Ross decided that he was gonna do, because everybody's expecting that they're gonna have a big old dance and they're gonna just dance and dance and dance. So what he decided was, I'm gonna turn the whole thing on his head. And he filmed the entire end of the movie in slow motion. When we were in Utah, where we shot, they finished filming with three nights, uh, three days and nights of shooting the entire end of the movie in slow motion with confetti falling like this and people going like that. <laughs> so they come back and they put the movie together and Kevin Bacon comes running down and goes, I thought this was going to be a party. Let's dance. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And everybody starts going and it slows down into this very beautiful, but it's like coitus interruptus. <laughs> it, it really is. It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, we're gonna get that. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> so we get back, and Herbert is very insistent that this is the way the movie's gonna end. The studio people are going, no, you're crazy, you're crazy. <laughs> so we go and we do one of these screenings. Like, you know, we do not just one, we do like three or four screenings. And they're all going, love the movie until the end, love the movie until the end, <laughs> rip off, rip off. And um, <laughs> so what happened was, we had to go back to the studio, we had to get more money, and we brought about eight of the kids who were the color, local color from Utah. We brought all of our stars back together again. 
and they all had to get their hair cut and they all had to get their prom dresses back on again. And we went into rehearsal on the lot at Paramount. And the entire sequence that you see now was shot, it was again, the movie wow. was shot, the end of the movie was shot again. And it was at that point that it was, it was like, give them what they want. Let's just, and so we threw in the guy who's doing the popping and the rocking and the, <laughs> and the you know. And the, the way I explained it to myself was that these people have been repressed all this time and they've been doing this in their bedrooms ah. and they have no place to do it and now they're suddenly getting a chance to like do it out front. Uh, well, I mean, you have, you've done a lot of music. Uh, you won an Oscar with Michael Snow, correctly, for? With Michael Gore. Michael Gore and for Fame. For Fame. Uh, fame and the soundtrack, I mean, music is fickle. It doesn't usually, a lot of music does not stand the test of time. Yeah. How, why do you think you, all this music is still, it's being used in movies all the time. Yeah. Uh, so why do you think these songs, Fame and Footloose, has really still hits people in 2014? Well, I'll, I mean, I'll tell you, I think it, that with Michael Gore's help, we, we wrote something that had a kind of a universal message. I think Fame spoke in 1980 and continues to speak in 2014. But I'll tell you an interesting story about this film in particular because... Because going back to this idea, this notion that I had, that I shared with you about it being a fable and therefore it stays out of, outside of time. We were making this movie at about the, just about the pinnacle of the disco era. Just before disco was about to go. But there were a lot of sounds, you know, I started writing this movie in 80, we made it in 83 and it came out in 84. So we're recording during a period of time when Donna Summer is on the charts and there's a lot of sounds that, and remember that one year before this came out, uh, Flashdance had come out. Mm. And so there was a lot of synthesizer stuff being wah, 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 wah. And then there was a lot of wah, wah pedal in, uh, in guitar sounds and a lot of uh, um, uh, generated, um, machine generated drum sounds which were like, thought of as very hip, very hot, very happening. And I didn't want to use any sounds of that era that would, would t stick us to, to uh, 1984. And so I was very assiduous about seeking out uh, Tom Snow and I wrote pop. We wrote somebody's eyes, we wrote let's hear it for the boy. And let's hear it for the boy has been re-recorded over the years here and abroad and it just comes back and it sounds fresh. It's a good, solid pop tune. Um, and a lot of other stuff that we did was very, it, it pulled from very strong traditions, rock and roll. The Girl Gets Around, Sammy Hagar, mm. Footloose was, is very, that's, that's rock and roll. You don't, that doesn't come in or go out of fashion. But what really was the determinant, and I, uh, this is why I asked you to ask me about this before, is because <laughs> our director, Herbert Ross, had done a lot of Broadway. And he had directed a lot of shows on Broadway. And one of the big traditions, you know, on Broadway is you go out of town and you try a show out out of town and you, if you need hole, if you have holes in the show, you patch them and you write new stuff out of town. And you, you always have, in your hotel room, you have a piano so that you can, like, work on the new stuff. When we were doing this movie, of course, every song had to be demoed so that we could get artists to do it. But it was expensive to do a demo because you needed studio time. It wasn't like now where you can do a demo on a laptop. You had to go into a studio with a band and a background singers and mix it and all this other stuff. So we did not have a lot of money for this. And so what Herbert Ross did was he had a, an upright piano moved into his office and before we got the go-ahead to record a demo of a song, we had to come in and play it for him. Kenny Loggins played Footloose on the guitar. Um, uh, Jim Steinman came in and played Holding Out for a Hero, going <laughs> and playing like crazy at the piano. And at the end of our little presentation, there was blood on the keyboards. Oh, on the keyboard because of his, he's just a madman at the keyboard. Um, so what happened was between Let's Hear For The Boy, I'm Free, Footloose, Almost Paradise, all these songs, they didn't just sort of like go off and be made in a studio where only a few people would ever be able to record it. These songs get, can get sung around a piano. 
they, they started off being sung around a piano or on a couch with Kenny Loggins with a guitar over his knee singing and Herbert Ross going, okay, we can demo that. I'll give you the permission to, the funds to do that. And it was because we started so bare, we had to make it work there. And then it worked when you made a record of it. And I think that those songs get played and sung and karaoke and re-recorded and danced <laughs> on Dancing with the Stars and used on, you know, uh, The Voice and American Idol because they were manageable at, uh, they, they, they held together as songs before they became records. Well, clearly, Dave, because you did, the, uh, you said mentioned the Broadway show and, of course, the remake with Julianne Hough. Yep. So, yep. Uh, how did you feel about the remake? Just here? Well, you know, I, I deliberately stepped away from the remake mm. because I met with the director who was very kind and very solicitous and asked a lot of questions of me, but he said, you know, I want you to be involved, I want you to see dailies, and I, and I, I called the producer afterwards and I said, I don't want to because I will, I will, even if I influence him just even a little bit, I'm going to sort of steer him back in a direction that I'm comfortable with mm. and I want to see what he does with it. Um, the only thing that I will say that I thought was, and I thought that he did some, he made some very nice choices, and I thought that he was extremely respectful of the original movie. I was very pleased with what he did. The only thing that I would, if I could go back in time and talk to him about, is something that was interesting because Herbert Ross, who did the original movie, was an ex-ballet dancer who'd choreographed on Broadway for ballet and had filmed a lot of musicals on screen. And he cast non-dancers mm. to do this. Because he, what, like you said, when they finally get to dance, they don't dance like the people on So You Think You Can Dance right. and uh, on Dancing with the Stars. They dance like kids. And when it came time to cast the remake, uh, Paramount Pictures had fallen in love with Julianne Hough, and they wanted Julianne Hough in this movie. And she had become a big breakout star on Dancing with the Stars. And so this director arrived and sort of had Julianne Hough, and it, she's a lovely actress, but it was because of her caliber of dancing that the whole thing moved up so that there are a lot of big breakout dance sequences. And they're, they're not sort of coming to it like kids off the street. Interesting. Um, it's interesting. So the, the idea that they put a star into it changed theoretically the movie, just like Tom Cruise would have been in a slightly different movie if... Well, Tom, yeah, maybe so. Tom Cruise, yes, because by the time our movie came out, Tom Cruise had become a big deal from Risky Business. And Kevin Bacon really wasn't. This, this put him on the map. He had done Friday the 13th, he had done a small role in Diner, mm. but he had not carried a movie like this. And uh, have you run into the old gang at uh, any recent anniversaries, Kevin Bacon, Laurie Singer? Or? No, but I, I, you know, funny thing is I run into Kevin at airports. <laughs> I do. I, I run into him at airports um, probably three times in the last five years. Um, <laughs> and, we're just going in opposite directions. Lori, I haven't seen in a long time. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker, I see in New York uh, from time to time. We, we end up at restaurants and stuff like that. Yeah, your movie launched her career, too. So it seems like, you know, you're, you're launching a few careers there. Well, look at that. There, yeah. was, there was Kevin Bacon, Sarah Jessica Parker. John Lithgow had oh, yeah. not had that kind of, you know, he had had two small roles before this. And one of his movies had not come out yet, um, in terms of endearment. And Diane Wiest who would go on to win two Academy Awards. She had done a small movie called Independence Day and th then this. And so Herbert Ross, but I credit Herbert Ross because there are a lot of directors in Hollywood when they see an, or they know that an actor is coming in, they want to know who has that actor worked with. And if a casting director can tell them, oh, he just did the new Spielberg movie and he just worked with the Coen brothers and things like that, the director feels a little bit more justified in casting this person because if he doesn't have faith in his own taste, he has faith in some other people have given the stamp of approval to that actor. Herbert Ross never, ever cast like that. He didn't need anybody else to tell him that these, these were 
all people with two credits, three credits, none of them having roles this big. And he, he cast Kevin, ba uh, uh, he cast John Lithgow in the room. Um, the, the, I had written the role to be a kind of a Paul Newman, charismatic, good-looking kind of, and the casting director, our casting director, Marcy Liroff, who was here a couple of weeks ago to talk about her career, she had this bee in her bonnet about John Lithgow. She just thought that he was this fantastic new talent coming out. And Herbert Ross was resistant, resistant, resistant. He said, all right, bring him in for a meeting. And he, um, Marcy Liroff and John Lithgow sat, sat in Herbert's office and Marcy read with John Lithgow and Herbert gave him the role. In the room. He didn't talk to anybody at the studio. He said, I, you're going to do my movie. At, that's the kind of taste level that he had. He just believed in himself. Interesting. Well, we always uh, end our show with the same question, and we're going to give it to you. Can you tell us about a special movie theater experience you had growing up, perhaps with your family, or some special movie you remember going to as a child? I will tell you, uh, this was, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> and this was actually the basis of my first novel, uh, called The Big One-O, which is about a disastrous 10th birthday party that this uh, <laughs> nine-year-old boy throws for himself. Um, but... <laughs> I was growing up in Honolulu, and this was in the 50s. We did not have a lot of access to culture from your country. Um, <laughs> and there was a small theater near our house called the Kaimaki Theater. And the Kaimaki Theater was the only place you could go for air conditioning. And my parents, it was the only place my parents could park us and get rid of us on an afternoon. And so um, my brothers and I would go to the Kaimaki Theater pretty much every Saturday in the afternoon and there would be like cartoons and there'd be like a f double feature and it would, it would get us out of the house for like four hours or something like that. And the Kaimaki Theater would alternate every other week they had an American movie and every other week they had a Japanese movie because of the population of Honolulu. And we would go no matter what. <laughs> and the Japanese movies did not have subtitles. They just went, oh, 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 you know, a lot of samurai, a lot of samurai. But we were just happy to eat licorice and sit in a cold environment. One, my, my mother allowed each of us, uh, there were three boys, and then years later my sister came along, but e allowed each one of us to have one birthday party. And the birthday party was when we were in first grade. Because you're in first grade is the first chance that you have to be social, and you have some friends, and you can invite them over. So my older brother, who was just a year ahead of me, was going to be having uh, his birthday. And my mother said, what are we going to do? We're going to have some people over. You can invite your friends over. And we had gone to the movie theater, and we saw previews of coming attractions. And the preview of the coming attractions was for a, you know, in the 50s, there were all these movies about monsters and monstrous things that had been created by nuclear energy, because that was the legacy of World War II. And so this particular movie was called The Giant Claw. <laughs> and The Giant Claw was about an eagle that I guess had become irradiated. And the eagle was the size <laughs> of a 747. And the eagle would swoop down and pick up busloads of kids and co convertibles of teenagers and crush them. And, and I think it was a Japanese movie that had been dubbed into... English, because the Japanese were always doing like the Godzillas, and you know, and the people would, um, whenever the shadow, you'd see the shadow of the the eagle f swooping over a city, and people would pour out of buildings, and they would go, the claw, the claw, <laughs> and it was, oh, it was just, uh, and w my brothers and I thought that this was going to be like the coolest. It was really, and so my mother, in trying to figure out what she's going to do, you know, the idea was like, we're going to do pin the tail of the dog. No, no. Well, let's take them all to see the giant claw. And she says, what's the giant claw? And it was, oh, it's the coolest movie, Mom. It's going to be such a cool movie. So 10 kids come over, my mom and a neighbor, with two station wagons, load the 10 kids, and we all go up. I'm, I'm allowed to go because I'm the brother of the birthday boy. We all go to see the giant claw. And the girls think it's gross, and the guys think it's cool. And we all come home. And we all do the birthday cake, and we do the presents, and the parents come, and they take the kids away. And it's like, <laughs> next morning, the phone starts to ring. <laughs> <laughs> and these people are calling, they're saying to my mother, 
what movie did you take my <laughs> child to see yesterday? <laughs> and my mother saying, why? Why? What happened? She said, well, little Keone or little, you know, Susie, they, would, they woke up screaming in the middle of the night. And I ran into their bedroom and they were pointing at the ceiling going, the claw, the claw. And my mother was so mad at us for having gotten her into that situation. We thought that was so cool. <laughs> that we had cre we had done a birthday that would had, had traumatized so many of my brother's friends, and so that has been that that was the first time that I had a, this this because you have to understand the idea of going into an air conditioned theater was practically empty on a Saturday afternoon. It was very insular. It was just sort of him and me, him and me. And the idea of going in, and, and we, I was never sitting in a theater full of people laughing and having a joint uh, uh, reaction, a, a communal experience together. That was the first uh, intimation that I had, that you could go to a darkened theater and everybody could come out and be changed. So that was my... Uh, that was my favorite. But well, from a movie that you, you have to IMDB it, though, because it's, it really is out there, the giant claw. Well, it's going to be our next script to screen because it <laughs> sounds too awesome. Uh, well, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank Thanks you. to the Poly thank Theater so interns. Much. And, of course, thank our righteous guest, Mr. Righteously Rad guest, <laughs> Dean Pitchford, and the, uh, sharing the 30th anniversary. So thank my you pleasure. so much. and Thank you.